taking up first the emergency bill remote deed recording. And I believe there's also powers of attorney. <coughs> and this will be part of a package of civil leg legislation that will be put forth. <coughs> Excuse me, and I'll turn it over to Eric and then Terry Corson. All right. Uh, thanks, Senator Sears. This is uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with uh, the Office of Legislative Council talking about some proposed legislation that the committee is considering regarding remote uh, notarization of deeds and powers of attorney. Uh, as you mentioned, with Senator Sears, the, uh, the deeds language was before the committee. I think it was Tuesday that, yeah. that we met earlier this week. Um, and uh, in addition, since then, there's been another issue raised having to do with powers of attorney. And the reason that uh, these are here before the committee now, you may recall, with respect to the, the witnessing of wills and notarization of wills language that you passed on Tuesday, and that then passed the Senate in S316, the issue was that uh, notarization of some of these official documents requires that the notarization be done in the presence of the notary and sometimes in the presence of witnesses as well. But the physical presence uh, requirement has become very challenging during the uh, pandemic because people either don't wanna travel, they're afraid to travel or to be in the same place with a number of other people to execute these documents. So the big picture on that is that uh, essentially, the language that you have in front of you, if you if you had a chance to look at it yet, very very similar to the language that you already passed with respect to um, the remote notarization of wills. Yeah. Yeah. You know the the concept is the same, which is that if the uh, notarization is done in consistency and and in conformity with the emergency remote notarization wills. Remember, we talked about those earlier in the week as well that the Secretary of State's office uh, is putting out. And I have uh, heard now that uh, they were adopted on Wednesday. So the, the rules have been adopted. Uh, if if uh, the notarization is done in compliance with those rules, then physical presence is not required. It's the same concept that you had in the wills. It now would be uh, uh, essentially the same concept with respect to powers of attorney. So, for example, you're having you're executing a power of attorney that allows someone to make decisions on behalf of the principal, decisions about selling property, about uh, uh, they can be health care decisions. Uh, those requirements that uh, that the document be notarized in the presence of the notary, the physical presence of the notary would be subject to these emergency rules. So, and those would allow. Um, and I, I actually put on the on the website if anybody wants to look at it. Secretary of State's office has been working on some guidance, so how this is going to work. And so it's a draft version of it. It's not the final version. I should mention that um, uh, I think even last night that Terry and members of the Bar Association and others have been going back and forth with the Secretary of State's office to get this language finalized. So this is, this is not the final version, but it is helpful to at least take a look at it and see how detailed it is. And I just wanted to just mention one point um, because you would refer to the Senator to Sears, I think when you were reporting S316, which is that you know it has to comply, these, this remote notarization procedure has to comply with this, um, this setup in the rules. And as the guidance describes, remember Senator to Sears, the notion of a secure communication link. So that's, yeah. how, that's how this remote notarization has to happen. And there's some specifics about that and definition of that in the rules and in the guidance, which is very helpful. Uh, it says that it has to allow for direct real-time interaction between the principal, the signer, and the notary. It has to be of such quality that clear visual observation of the face of each participant and clear visual observation of the identification being provided because the person has to identify themselves. It's interesting the way the rule is written. If the, if the two people know each other and they recognize each other sufficiently, and then I don't think the identification is required. But if they don't, then you have to put something up like a driver's license or something like that that identifies you mm. as who you uh, assert to be. <coughs> as, as, uh, as you mentioned, there's, there's an audio visual function. So it's, it can't just be audio, it has to be audio visual and it can't be pre recorded. So you have this uh, lengthy uh, list of rules and guidance that is still being worked on. And I think, they're, as I say, the language is being worked on literally 
today. Um, but the but the bottom line is, is that if the procedure complies with that remote notarization rule, then the notaries can use this secure communications link rather than having to be in the physical presence of each other. So if you look at those statutes, the language that's in the two uh, amendments you have before you, both the powers of attorney and the uh, the deed witnessing both say physical presence. They were oh, sorry, acknowledge in the presence of the notary. So the rule that uh, video remote secure communication link would be permitted. Yeah, it, Eric, That's just so picture. it's clear, clear to me and, and every, anybody who may be listening in, none of this is effective in terms of the deeds, the wills, or the power of attorney until the Secretary of State does his um, rules and until the governor signs a bill. Am I correct? Uh, that's correct, Senator Sears. And also, that's a good point. I, I, I wanted to add that you met, you were pointing out when we met on Tuesday with respect to the deeds, at least, that the way the deeds language had been written originally, it was not limited to the time period that those emergency rules were in effect. And it also sort of incorporated by reference the potential for some federal uh, uh, permission of remote uh, remote deed or sorry remote notarization so those two pieces have been struck to make it and so instead it's very much yeah. parallel to the wills piece so it has to be done while the emergency rules are in effect and it's only uh references those vermont rules rather than uh, anything from anywhere else okay um any questions for eric on the committee uh, i was just going to add one more sentence one more piece if i could You'll see if you, if there's a one other uh, piece added to both bills that is basically saying, and I think Terry will be able to talk about this a little bit more, uh, but it came up during their discussions with Chris Winters at the Secretary of State's office that would it would be important to include in statute uh, some language that provided that um, if the if the document is executed in compliance with these emergency rules, then it will be. Um, presume valid in the future so that if litigation came up, if there, if there were challenges around the, um, the authenticity or the validity of the document, that you'd have statutory language saying that, well, if the, if the rules were followed, then it, there's a presumption that they're valid. And that presumption could always be overcome, of course, if there was some evidence to the contrary, but at least there'd be a presumption. Alice, you... Eric, can I ask a question? Yes. yes. Can I, you guys, can I interrupt for one second? I apologize. I just got an email from IT. And they said they're listening to the live streaming. There's lots of noise in the background. And they asked that everybody self mute unless you're speaking. There is there everybody do what? To, it sounds like somebody's doing dishes. Yeah, they what said. What do you it, want us to do? Um, uh, well, Senator White, for you to self to for you to self mute, you have to press star six. I know I can uh, I have a mute button. I can mute myself. Okay. They're I have to press star six. Yep, and all of you guys that Once. are on Zoom, you just have to go to the corner, the right corner of where your, your tile is and press mute. Because um, they said it's really difficult for people to hear and I know there's a lot of people listening. But may, should, may we press, it, Eric, should we press, can should I we press mute before, before we do that? Yep, so in the, in the right corner where you guys, your tile is, there's like three dots. If you press that, that gives you the option to mute. Okay, okay. We, you can't press mute if you're talking. No, if you're talking. Course, you have to unmute, but if you're talking, you unmute yourself, but everybody else should mute themselves if they thank, can. Thank, thank you, Peggy. Go ahead, Eric. No, that was my same Could question, I Senator Sears. I think, Senator, I think Senator Nitka has a question or Senator White? I have, uh, yeah, Senator I have White a question. Does. Nitka does too. Um, I'm just okay. wondering, um, we're doing all this. It sounds like the Secretary of State has already gone forward with all this. And what you're saying is they can't do this without us. They can't do what they want to do without us doing this. Is that correct? Uh, no, I think it's I think it's the opposite. They can go ahead and do what they're going to do. But these statutory changes bring the statutes into conformity with their rules. I see. And right. is it clear that can I ask another question? Is it clear when the emergency is over that this will no longer be in place? Yes. Y yes. Okay. And let's see. May I okay, that's my question. Jeanette? Okay. 
So um, just on, line, on the first page there on lines 20 and 21, who, who um, attaches the affirmative statement? I, I don't quite get how that works. That's the uh, the person executing the document, and the affirmative. This that's actually a reference to something that's in the rules. That okay. uh, that certificate is a requirement of the rules. That that a person doing one of these notarial documents remotely has to include a certificate that the procedures of the rules were followed. So what that's saying okay. is, and that's the new sentence that I was uh, referring to earlier. What that's saying is that. You have to take that certificate and attach it to it. And if that certificate, which is saying um, all the rules were complied with when this remote notarization process occurred, then the then it will pr be presumed valid in the future. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Everybody. So, good. Terry, may uh, I ask I'm not one more question. Okay. Me. Is, is the Secretary of State with us right now? Huh? It, it, so is the Secretary of State on the line? No, the Secretary of State is not on the line. Okay. I because um what we heard in GovOps was that um they were doing the emergency rules and I'm just we don't have to do anything more in there, right? Because they're doing the emergency rules and then we're doing this in here. So we don't have to do anything more in GovOps. No, I wouldn't think. Okay. No, I think okay. that's I think that's correct, Senator White. Okay, thank you. Terry, um, did you want to comment, and then Judge Grierson? Yeah, no, I have nothing to add to what um, Eric said. Although Eric, it's my understanding that the emergency notarization rules have been issued, that the Secretary of State has done the steps to have them issued. Yes, I, I heard that too. I think it was Wednesday. Okay, and then we're just working on the guidance with them, which hopefully um, will be coming out shortly just to give guidance. But otherwise, you explained it very nicely. <laughs> Judge Grierson, any comments? Oh, you got to unmute yourself. The judge is still muted. Yes, okay. Um, no, I do not have any comments. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, Eric and Terry, thank you very much. And Judge, what I plan to do is next Tuesday is look at a final draft of these two things, plus the statute of limitations that Bryn's working on. Okay. That's what I was wondering, Senator Sears. Just should I should I incorporate these into uh, a separate bill, or what your thoughts were on that? Well, I would thought we would do two separate bills: one on the on the uh, civil side, and one on the on the criminal that Judge Grierson's emergency order, or I would do one big bill. I don't care. I think it's probably easier to do one big bill for everybody. And is this uh, going to be a committee bill or? I, I, I think it's easier to just take some Senate bill that's still on the wall and pass it. I, I need oh, to yeah. check with Senator Ash how they want to do that. Okay. Thanks. Can I right ask? Now it's XXX. Right. <laughs> Can I ask, what's the uh, statute of limitations bill that Bryn's working on? Well, it's, it's, it's a, I, I believe it's a request from the um, bars, from uh, certain attorneys who would or like to see a stay. A, a, so a stay of all statute of limitations. I believe that Bryn would be better to speak if she's still with us, but I believe that New York, the governor there did it by, um, an emergency order that all right. all statute of limitations were i don't know how it reads if right. Bryn's still here she could probably explain it yeah no yeah. i can follow up with her after i i just i'll send you an email judge thank you very much Bryn. oh Bryn, you're there good yeah <laughs> thank you okay thank you all um so is is steve howard available yet wasn't aware that he was coming on. There are two numbers that are unidentified. One ends with 025, another with 032. If you can tell me who you are, please. It's Mike uh, Missouri Missouri. and John Campbell. Yeah. Okay, you both talked at once. All right, 9025 is Pepper. Okay. Okay, well, I, had zero, zero, three. 
I had scheduled Woodside at, uh, there might be some confusion. I thought like 120. And, um, That's what I told them. Yeah. So I don't know if they're having a hard time getting in or why they aren't there. These are challenging times. Well, they are. Hello, Senator. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Is this Steve? That's me. Oh, good. It says Amy. <laughs> oh, Amy Kinsel, right. All right, Amy, go ahead. <laughs> I can see you now, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to explain that this is, um, it's not really Woodside. I don't know what you call it anymore. Uh, as you all know, the, we moved the, um, we didn't do it. Um, <clears throat> they moved the uh, kids from Woodside to uh, St. Albans to a, a house up there or building, I don't know. And uh, we had some testimony from uh, Commissioner Schatz about it the other day. Next week, we'll have a joint hearing with um, Senate Health and Welfare at one of the days, maybe Wednesday, um, and hear from uh, DCF and uh, DMH on this move and any others who want to be involved. But I thought I'd give Steve Howard a chance to comment on behalf of the employees who have uh, been, I don't know if they have all the employees been moved there or some of them are still Woodside or maybe you can help us with that, Steve. Go ahead. Uh, I think they haven't moved to Woodside. Um, I just got off the phone with them. And uh, I think, uh, first of all, thank you, Senator, for the opportunity. And I also just want to thank the members of the committee for raising some of the concerns that they heard from our members at Woodside. I did, um, right after your last hearing, have a very productive conversation with the commissioner about some of their concerns. And some of them have been addressed. Uh, they, are, they have figured out some of the logistical concerns. I think the first thing that our members wanted, wanted to stress is uh, that despite the chaos and the sort of abrupt change, I mean, our members at Woodside have been through an awful lot this year and recently, uh, that they are 100% committed to making this work and to taking care of the youth that they have um, there at this new facility, and they hope for the resources and the support that they need to do that. Um, some of the questions that I think are being addressed uh, that are just I think percolating out there. One is a security concern. I, I do understand from the commissioner. I don't think this has happened yet, but you know the the facility is uh, is not a it's a staff secure facility. Uh, so the doors are, don't have alarms on them yet. The windows don't have locks on them yet. And it's not just a concern about um, the youth leaving the facility, which is a concern, but. Uh, an, uh, another concern of, about people finding out where where this facility <laughs> is and being able to access it from external forces. So people who have a beef with somebody who's there or are mad at, at the staff who are there. So uh, security is an issue. I think the department has addressed uh, the, sh the lack of, of uh, rooms to sleep in and shower space for the staff uh, with hotel rooms down in, in, uh, in St. Albans. Um, I think uh, one big concern that they have, and, and I think you know, this is a chaotic moment, and they understand that. Um, this is a very different program than what they had previously at, at, at Woodside. Uh, there is a lot of commitment from the leaders there to uh, roll out um, what the program is supposed to look like now. Um, it's a little confusing because they have in the last three months, they've had three different leaders um, and they have a new leader now and hopefully uh, somehow they will be able to get some clarity on what the program is there. I think what to sum it up, what our members are doing, and I think a lot of people are doing this these days is they are basically just winging it until they get some guidance from uh, someone about how this program is supposed to operate. Uh, there is a tiny rec yard there. It's shared space with other organizations that are there. Um, they can see that that's going to be a problem. I know that DCF is adding some <coughs> recreational capacity. Uh, they are nervous that this confinement issue and the lack of uh, activities to keep kids busy 
might result in some problems. Um, I do think we got the food situation resolved, um, but like anything else in state government, we are also very concerned about getting protective equipment, um, not only to all of the state employees across the state who don't have protective equipment, but, but also to our folks working at Woodside in what is very close quarters compared to what they, what they had at the original facility. Um, so I think those are, are basically the things that uh, they wanted to, to stress. I think one of the things they just really want to say that they, they, they're not exactly happy with the abrupt nature of how this happened, uh, but they are committed to making it work and, and that they understand that um, these kids are their first priority <coughs> and they will, uh, and they will make sure that they remain so. Well, thank you, Steve. Are there questions for Steve? Alice, Steve? I have a question. Yes, so, Alice. How many how many employees um, are now involved in the new facility? Uh, you know, I don't know that. I will. I would have to get that information from DCF, Senator. But I but I will get that for you. Uh, do you mean on each? Thank shift, you. Or do you mean in total? Total and how and then do they have enough on each shift? Just total number and. Okay. I will get that information, Senator, and get that to the committee. It's a, it's a good question, Allison. I guess <clears throat> one of my questions, and I expressed this to Commissioner Chats and to you earlier, and uh, it boggles my mind while we're still having sleeping shifts there, um, why that would be. Um, you know, you're, it's a much smaller building, and uh, so I don't understand that. So that's one question. The second is, in terms of the security, when we opened 206 Depot sometime in the, I'm going to say 90s, because I don't remember exactly when we bought that building, but, um, you know, one of the first, and it was pretty easy, just put in alarms. So you knew if somebody opened a window or opened a door, the alarm went off, and, that, and we were staff secure. Um, questions always asked, and I don't know if DCF has an answer or will have for next week, but I guess the question is, when a kid is going out the window, do you stop him or do you let him or her go? And I think that that's one thing. I think at Woodside, it was a little less likely to be given, given the, 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 the security there. Um, and that would be a question that I think needs to be answered for the staff. I don't know the answer to that. So Senator, I can say that, um, and I, I don't know if DCF will agree with this, but what I was told by our staff is that they, if somebody does attempt to leave, uh, that their instructions are to call the St. Albans police and describe to the St. Albans police what the kid is wearing and let the St. Albans police apprehend the kid. And I, we assume bring them back because there's no other place to put them. I mean, one thing that, that really is important is that the, the kids that are there, and I think there were four or five, uh, four or five kids there, um, they, you know, they were sent to a secure facility. So this is not a secure facility, but I do understand from what the commissioner said to me yesterday is that they are adding the alarms on the doors and they will be putting locks on the windows. There is a lot of concern about the amount of glass. Um, there are glass doors um, that, that need to be replaced. Um, both not solely from the perspective of concern about the, what the kids of the kids getting out, but of other people trying to get to those kids being able to get in. Well, uh, um, Deputy Commissioner Johnson is here, and I'm sure that she's taking the comments down as well. We'll have some answers for next week too. Um, but um, Steve, are, are any other committee members have questions about this? Um, I, I understand. I mean, I can't imagine how quickly this whole thing happened. And, uh, you know, change is always difficult, especially when you've got all the other things going on regarding the cor coronavirus and et cetera. And uh, that does create anxiety both for the kids and for the staff, I'm sure. So I have one more question, Alice. Sure, Alice. Um, I'm just wondering, so if there's a need for placements, um, outside there in, in our communities around the state for the service that Woodside was providing previously, will they be able to go into this placement? Uh, that, that, 
Senator, uh, respectfully, that may be a question for DCF. Uh, okay. Uh, my understanding is that they can, but I, I'll let DCF take that question. Okay, thank you. Did Christine, if you wanted to answer that question now, or if you have an answer. We can't hear you. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank yes. You. Okay, good. So, Alice, I just, I'm not sure that I understand your question. In other words, someone out in the community now commits an offense that would have maybe allowed them to go to Woodside. Will they, and that happens, uh, will they be able to go into the St. Albans facility? You know, yes. if, if they meet all the criteria and you need a placement. Yes, they will. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, anything else, Steve? From your oh, that, that's all I've got. Thank you, Senator. Well, I appreciate you taking the time with us, and uh, it's um, these are difficult times for everyone. And I know I'm hearing quite a bit regarding at the veterans home as well. And I hope that uh, maybe you and I and Senator Campion could have a call with um, some people from the uh, VSEA. Uh, about that. I don't know what we can do. I know they're very concerned about the lack of personal protective equipment down there. Right. Be happy to do that, Senator. I would appreciate that. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. All right. The next issue is Judge Grierson. Um, oh, Senator Sears, may I ask a question before Steve leaves? Yeah. Steve, are you, uh, I think he's gone, but. Oh, okay. I was going, it wasn't here. really a question. I was just going to say that we are tomorrow um, looking at VSEA issues, or this afternoon looking at VSEA issues. We're just getting a list of them, but we yeah. will just leave, um, because we do deal with state employees, but we will just leave the whole Woodside conversation in judiciary. Okay, but I hope you will. Um, there's a lot of concern, obviously, in any uh, nursing home and since state employees work at the yep. Vermont Veterans Home, they're really concerned yep. about the lack of masks and other personal protective equipment. Yeah, we're going to hear some of the issues tomorrow. I mean, Good. today. Today. Good. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, Judge, we've, we've gone over your proposal a little bit and haven't heard from the other players. I don't know if there's... I've got to now look up your proposal again. Which one is it? It's the, it's the, uh, and maybe if. It's on, it's on your uh, legislative page. It's under my name and it's a memorandum. Yeah. You have to go to the Judiciary Committee page. It's his memorandum. I don't okay, know if. if uh, Senate Judiciary. Yeah. It's, it's uh, a okay. two joint rules. It's it's the is same. Are we on the D? Is this is this? No, oh, is this, this is on the uh, proposal? on the emergency yes. the emergency legislative changes. Yep. I believe that so it, the, we we got it on the twenty third, so it might be on the twenty third. So when I when I click on that, I see this. Uh, Judge Grierson, Senate emergency. Business. If you go to the twenty third of of March. Oh, geez, I'm and get click there. on, on today, and it says it's, today. Yeah, today. Today. it's also today. I'm I'm on the the earlier okay. one. Okay. So Judge I see Grierson. proposed emergency legislative changes. Is that That's it? it. And, and we went the over sentence review. Yeah, yes, we got. I, as I remember it, we went over it, um, and uh, we ended at landlord tenant. I think we were right there, Judge. Um, and oh. your landlord tenant oh, okay. on page two, right. if I'm not mistaken. I think I think you're right. That we didn't discuss that. And that we did. Was, we did discuss it or we didn't? No, I think we did. It was just simply a change from okay. shall to may, which would right. give the court oh, the yeah. discretion on how much yeah. rent would be accumulating. So I, I guess I... Um, I would then, um, do you have anything to add, Judge, at this time? Not on the landlord-tenant. 
what about on the sentence review? Sentence review, um, as I said the other day, uh, Senator, sentence review right now, we can review a sentence within 90 days of a sentence being imposed. The language that we have proposed here would allow us to review sentences after 90 days, but only with the agreement of the prosecution and the defense. In other words, this isn't the court usurping anyone's authority. Um, and I'll give you an example. There was a case in Barrie uh, just this week where a fellow was due to be, uh, he was serving a sentence. He was due to be released, I wanna say mid-April. And both the state and the defense agreed that there was no point in leaving him there under the circumstances. It turns out that that case came within the 90 day threshold. So the attorneys agreed to a resentence that would allow him to be released today or this weekend. Um, so it worked because it came within the 90 days. But if this same fellow who was due to be released in two weeks, um, if it was beyond 90 days from sentence, we could not change his sentence. So this is just to give, quite frankly, not the court, but the parties, the attorneys, uh, more flexibility with some of these uh, folks who are incarcerated <coughs> to get out and would allow them to get out if they agree. If they don't agree, then it would not give us any authority. Oh. I, can I interrupt for a minute? I, th yeah. I, I, I thought in our last meeting we decided against this. Oh, I don't. I don't think so. I think well, I I don't quite a, they, I don't I had quite a discussion that. about it. We did, but I I think we wanted to hear from all the parties. I think the decision was to not put it uh, in what we were doing this past week, but yes. to defer it to now. Oh, okay. All right. So we That's would right. hear from the defense, the attorney general, the state attorneys and corrections. But th this is a permanent change, am I correct? Well, Senator, this is a policy decision. I think there's a, a place for it with or without the emergency setting, but if the, that either way would be fine. Um, okay. But I, I think there's some discussion, had been discussion about this even before this uh, pandemic came on. So, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't think I wouldn't think we'd want it in a bill that we want to pass. You mean as a permanent thing? Yeah. Where are we doing that now? Or how about for, during this um, pandemic? Alice, before we um, decide, it might be helpful to hear from the other witnesses. Okay. Okay. And, and Senator, do you wish to hear from the other witnesses on each piece, or do you want me to go through the whole bill? No, I think we've been through the whole bill. So the, the next piece is the Rule 43 changes. Um, um, okay. that will allow us to continue to use uh, video. And I do have some suggested language. If the committee supports this, I will get that language to Eric or Bryn, who's ever working on this. Okay. Okay. It essentially says that the presence of the defendant will be deemed to be- Somehow we're, we've got somebody on speakerphone. So you're getting an echo. But anyway, if the committee's interested, I can provide that language to Eric or Brenner. Yes. The other ones, the other uh, one bail, one review bail review is, we're supposed to have bail review hearings in 48 hours, 40 hours review conditions of release in five days. In five we're just days. finding we're that in this environment, we can't meet those deadlines. Those deadlines. Um, and I would think if they were extended, they were extended uh, to seven and 14 seven days, respectively, days, we could uh, fit into those, fit into those um, mm -hmm. time frames. Time frame. On mental health, on mental again, health, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't know why we're getting why feedback, we're getting but feedback. I'll continue to talk. Um, again, we're, it's difficult to meet those time frames in, in today's environment. Um, I will tell you that we're working very um, closely with the Department of Mental Health and the Attorney General's Office to try to do as many of these proceedings by video as we can, which may allow us to allow speed up the process. But again, I'm suggesting, again, I'm suggesting uh, we go to 14 go to days, 14 days uh, as a temporary measure, a temporary measure to get those scheduled. The civil suspensions, um, 
again, is a matter of these cases aren't being heard. Uh, suggest suggesting that moving the deadlines, expungement and sealing. I won't spend much time on that, except that it's clearly not a priority during this time. And we would ask that any guy, any time frames be suspended uh, while this emergency is in place. All right. And that is the whole that bill. Is the whole bill. It, is. it is. Okay. Um, next, um, next, any questions for any Judge Gerson? Uh, I do have a question. Uh, I do have a question. Bill? Bill? Judge Gerson, I'm Judge just wondering is this limited exclusively to reducing sentences? Well, let me, it's driven, you're talking about the first piece. Yes. I take it. So, it's driven by what we have been seeing in the courts and you know, reading newspapers and reports, Department of Corrections, uh, prosecutors, defense attorneys, there are certain individuals who are under sentence that um, could be released. Everyone agrees it could be released except the Senate structure itself is preventing them from being released. In other words, these are people that are not getting programming they're essentially doing dead time and they're going to be released, some of them in a relatively short time, but there's no way to restructure a sentence. They're not eligible for furlough. I do understand that. I, what I meant was, does it exclude the possibility that somebody's sentence could be made harsher? Harsher? Yes, longer. I, no, the, the short answer is no, because no one's going to agree to that. Well, I, I would like, Personally, I would like the legislation to be written to eliminate that as a possibility that everybody could agree that the sentence be lengthened. Because I'm sorry, the, the sentence what? If I understand what this says, it says with agreement of the parties, um, it could be the sentence could be modified. Could be modified to release the person. Only to, to release them. That would be the only reason the parties would agree to modify the sentence, I would think. Okay. But yeah, I, I, I suppose I, I, it's in a range of uh, concerns that I would situate Alice's concern to. In other words, wanting to limit this and to make sure it's very focused in terms of time, but also in what it allows in terms of modification. Um, I, I understand the concern, Senator, and that's why the, if you look at the language, this, again, this is not, this is more of a reaction to what the, I'm seeing, what the judges, courts are seeing um, in this period of an emergency, and it's only designed to work if the, the real parties in, in play, the, the state's attorney um, yeah. and, and the defense agree on this. Otherwise, the person's sentence will remain as it is, yep. as is. Yeah, I was just reacting because it said reduce or otherwise modify, which seemed a little, a little broad. <clears throat> well, certainly the language, uh, if, if other folks, uh, I'm not sure how other uh, parties feel about it. If we can't agree on language, then obviously the it's not going to go through. Okay. I, I'm, I'm amenable to any changes. I'm just trying to make this work from what I've seen, or what the concerns are um, with some of the people that are incarcerated that probably are going to be coming, they're going to be coming into the community. Um, and so this well, is a, a process but, to shorten. But I, I think if you hear from the other parties. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear from the other parties, but I want to make expressly clear that if somebody's coming out, they need to make sure, you know, they're coming out in very difficult times um, and jobs may not be available, housing may not be available, all of those other things. And I really am concerned about that. We're just, if we're just trying to unload people out of the correction facilities, I'm, it's one thing if somebody's on bail and we um, change the bail conditions or whatever, but quite another if they've been sentenced, been in for a year or two years, and now they're coming out at this particular time. I can't think of any time worse to come out, but particularly if you're a person without uh, structure. So, but I, uh, 
if um, Matt, if you could um, unmute yourself. And... Judge, um, before Matt comes on, I just want to make sure I know your position. This current proposal is being presented at a time when there's a declaration of emergency. Are you of the opinion this should be limited to the time where there is a declared emergency, or is this a permanent rule you wish to have placed into concrete? You know, Senator, that that's, I guess, a difficult question for me to answer for this reason. Um, I have heard um, in practice that when uh, beyond the 90 day period currently, there are some situations that are brought to the court's attention um, and parties agree that a sentence can be restructured for one reason or another, essentially re-sentence. And what I'm hearing, and I guess I've probably experienced it, some judges say no, because it's beyond the 90 days. Others, um, because the parties agree, uh, sometimes agree to a, a change in a sentence structure. Uh, so I think to some extent, not a great extent, but to some extent it happens. So I think under some circumstances, there is a place for this language even beyond the emergency, but I, I'm not here. I'm not here with this proposal advocating for this other than this is what I'm hearing in, in under these circumstances uh, that there's a, a, a place for this. Um, if, if the committee decides not to take it up, we're gonna continue to uh, operate within the parameters that we have. Um, okay, I, I just, I'm I think gonna ask place... this of the, I'm gonna ask this of the other two sure. witnesses, Matt and uh, looks like David is on, but I just wanna make sure that I understand your position. And from what I'm hearing is this would be a tool that in the long term would be beneficial as well as just now during this emergency. That's my sense. Okay. And, and I you. think I've heard that from other other judges as well. Okay. Um, you. If you think about it, and I'll I'll stop talking. You know, uh, there's been talk in some of the committees about the so-called second look. You know, uh, look at a sentence long after it's imposed, see if it still makes sense. This might Thank be you. a vehicle. Thank you. Okay. So, so this is, okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Alice. Did you have a question? Uh, I'm just wanting. So, or yeah. Okay. Are we? We're having another witness, right? I'm assuming. We have four more scheduled. Okay. Matt Valerio, David Shear, John Campbell, and um, Dale Crook. Crook. Okay. Okay, Matt. Yeah, I'm fine. You hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad. Glad it uh, worked out. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, we're actually a little surprised that this sentence review consideration is the thing that's drawing all of the attention um, <laughs> compared to the other things in the list. Um, I've I've spoken with Reg about.